United States plans to build up to seven offshore wind farms along U.S. coasts, setting forth a goal of generating 30 gigawatts of offshore wind energy by 2030. That's enough to power more than 10 million American homes. In the United States, there's enough offshore wind potential to basically power the entire country. But while the U.S. ranked second for wind production in 2020, it currently lags in offshore wind energy. The nation's first commercial farm, off the coast of Block Island, only began operation six years ago, and only one more has joined the ranks since then. This is in part due to the difficulty of finding spots to erect these massive 500 plus feet turbines. So what makes the perfect, or close to perfect, spot? Wind energy started to become a popular topic of conversation after the oil crises of the 1970s. But the first offshore wind farm wouldn't come for another two decades. In 1991, Denmark built the world's first offshore wind farm, which was dismantled in 2017. But it was capable of powering 2,200 homes and was located here, off the coast of a town called Vindivi. But here on this side of the pond, the United States' first commercial offshore farm didn't begin operation for another 25 years. Block Island's farm consists of five turbines, each towering close to 600 feet. That's almost twice as tall as the Statue of Liberty, and the blades themselves are close to the length of football fields. The turbines send electricity back to the shore via a network of undersea cables. Block Island's turbines are secured to the seafloor, but that's not always the case. In deeper waters, turbines are built to float. More on that later. By now you might be thinking, what is the point of all this extra work when we have vast tracts of uninhabited land? Fundamentally speaking, the technology is the same, but there are pros and cons to both off and onshore turbines. Onshore wind farms are currently the cheapest electric option. They're both quicker to install and easier to maintain, but there are certain limitations, like geography. The around 60% of the U.S. population that lives far from coastal areas are often spread far and wide, making consolidation of wind farm energy more difficult. Contrast that with the around 40%, or over 128 million people, who live in much denser coastal communities, including the nation's biggest cities. You're still transporting the electric energy over a much shorter distance back to a coastal city than if you were tra transporting it from a big wind farm, say, in the Great, Great Plains, in the middle of the country, where uh, another location of, of good wind resources. So where your electrical load is, which is concentrated on the coasts or near the coasts, is also an advantage for offshore. Additionally, onshore wind can be inconsistent, depending on physical characteristics of the region. If you look at things like mountains, hills, buildings, forests, and even, even fields, they add up to friction on the wind, which slows wind down a bit. That friction is a lot less on, on, on flat, open water. And that open water actually ends up being, believe it or not, the key to several advantages for offshore wind farms. First, these offshore turbines are usually built larger than their on-land counterparts. The tallest on-land turbine in the U.S. is in Hancock, Maine, towering 574 feet tall. Block Island's offshore farm, as mentioned previously, is around 590 feet. While those may seem close in size, GE just developed an offshore wind turbine that towers over 850 feet. But in the US, if you build over 499 feet, the FAA requires extra approval steps. Another reason for those larger offshore turbines simply relates to logistics. When transporting materials on land, you have to deal with challenges like narrow tunnels, which can be avoided if you use special ships on sea for transport. Bigger can also mean better. Size does matter. So if you uh, build a turbine with twice the diameter, you have four times the area, four times the power. The wind also gets stronger the, the higher you are up from the surface. And I think most, uh, most of us know this from having flown kites at one point in our childhood. The higher the kite flies, uh, the better it flies, right? But that relationship between wind speed and energy production is not linear. So if you have twice the wind speed, you have eight times the power. So even small increases in turbine power height will, will give you a good increase in power. This also means that the taller and bigger the turbine, the more cost-effective in the future. Despite all these pros, offshore wind farms have one major issue. Location, location, location. As advantageous as the ocean is in theory, not all coastlines are created equal, which leads to some thorny problems. 
First up is the proximity to the coast. Most people want them far enough away that they won't be an eyesore. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, as the wind is generally stronger farther from the shore. But the issue here? It costs more money to bring the electric energy back to, back to shore. Like millions more. An underwater power cable is very expensive, costing anywhere from one to three million dollars per kilometer. Typically, offshore farms are built to about 26 miles off the coastline. So building any farther just for eyesore avoidance quickly becomes economically questionable. Then comes the question of how the turbine will be mounted. Turbines that are mounted to the ocean floor can be installed in water up to about 170 feet or 60 meters deep. The continental shelf along the east coast of the United States extends an average of 75 miles offshore, meaning the water is generally shallow enough. America's western Pacific coast, on the other hand, is narrower, extending only 20 miles, quickly reaching depths of 2 to 300 feet. In deeper waters like these, the only feasible option is turbines that float. This is a newer technology. The world's first farm featuring floating turbines was commissioned in 2017. Here it is, 15 miles off the coast of Scotland. But researchers at the University of Maine have been working on bringing it to the U.S. for over 14 years. We have over 40 engineers working on just floating wind. And it's the largest concentration of, of engineers working on floating wind in the country. It will be the first full-scale floating turbine in the United States, potentially even the biggest in the world, and could make the U.S. less reliant on other countries' technologies. But water depths are just one of the challenges. Researchers need to determine the geology of the seafloor. How deep is the soil? Are there rocks? Is the floor leveled? Who are the stakeholders? Uh, in addition to the geophysical surveys, we said we have, um, we have also uh, wind surveys that you would do. You have to put anemometers in the water, or um, it, when you have to deeper waters, we put buoys. They're, they're, these are actually buoys uh, more to the seabed that have lidars on them. We call them floating lidar buoys. With all the studies required, building and, and then bringing all the uh, wind turbine parts to location, I would say that large offshore wind farms can take anywhere from five to almost 10 years to build. And once those studies are completed, price tags of proposed projects can reach billions of dollars. And then, even if you manage to line up the perfect spot, all the necessary equipment, convince the local governments to pay for it and coastal residents not to oppose it, you'll still have to worry about local residents and wildlife. In May of 2022, two energy companies bought an 110,000 acre site 20 miles off the coast of the Carolinas to develop offshore wind. The project would generate over 1.3 gigawatts of energy within 10 years, or enough to power half a million homes. But commercial and recreational fishers are concerned. The site is home to ancient reefs, old shipwrecks, and popular fish like grouper, snapper, and bluefin tuna. Engineers also stress that when building wind farms, migration paths need to be taken into consideration for those under the sea and above it. So what makes the perfect spot for an offshore wind farm? Well, clearly it's a mix of things. It's the distance away from the coast, finding appropriate water depth, and of course, making sure to coordinate with all the stakeholders, especially those who were there before you. But the benefits on saving energy and potentially the planet could be immense. If we harness just 3% of the surface area of the Gulf of Maine, just 3%, we can heat every home in Maine and drive every car in the future, which three percent of the Gulf of Maine. So, so, um, so the other ninety-seven percent will still be open for fishing. So, I think there is an opportunity to to to, to work together with the fishing industry uh, and and satisfy our need for renewable energy as a society. What do you think about offshore wind farms? Where do you think the best spots are? Leave a comment below and don't forget to like and subscribe.